EMFs, electromagnetic fields, a pernicious health risk. But how do they damage your health? Hi, this is Dr. Mercola helping you take control of your health. And today we are beyond honored and privileged to have someone to talk to and help educate us on this topic. And I believe there's very few people I've interviewed. I've interviewed a lot of people, but very few who I believe truly deserve a Nobel Prize for his pioneering research in this area to help us understand and identify the mechanism of how electromagnetic fields damage our cell. He's uniquely gifted to do this because he has training in physics uh, and biochemistry, and I think the physics, one of them is from Caltech and the other is from uh, Johns Hopkins, so two very prestigious universities, and then he's also a professor emeritus at Washington State University. And the man is Dr. Martin Paul, P-A-L-L, -L, and we are just, you're in for an engaging, amazing conversation. So welcome and thank you for joining us today, Dr. Paul. Thank you, thank you, it's a pleasure. So before we start engaging this, I just want people to understand your background and why, as I mentioned, you're so uniquely gifted in this area because most researchers don't have your uh, skill set and training to understand the molecular biology of what goes on to how EMFs can cause this damage. Okay, well, well, I got my bachelor's in physics and I got my PhD in biochemistry and genetics. Uh, and, and what I've been doing for the last 18 years or so is working on basically the, the medical literature, including basic science medical literature, putting things together that have been done by other people. There's a huge amount of information out there that you know that that nobody's got time to reach nobody's got time to integrate and, and digest and make connections so that's what i've been doing for predominantly for the last 18 years um i was interested in emfs uh before you know before i could understand what how they work but uh and and so when i stumbled onto basically two papers that told me well this looks like the way they work and then I dug out uh, more and more papers, initially 23, and then 24, and now 26. And actually, there are a number of others I haven't published on. And they all show that EMFs work by activating what are called voltage-gated calcium channels. So these are channels These are channels in the outer membrane of the cell, the plasma membrane that surrounds all of our cells. And when they're activated, they open up, and they allow calcium to flow into the cell. The excess calcium in the cell, which is responsible for most, if not all, of the Yeah, and let's stop there in your journey because it was actually that was the original. I mean, there's hundreds of studies that show that when you expose cells to EMFs, there's increased intracellular calcium. That's right. Yeah, and that's undispu indisputable. That's just fact. Yeah, and you also get you also get increases in calcium signaling, mm -hmm. which is very important. So then you, then you found these two dozen studies and put the whole mechanism together. So I'm sorry I interrupted you. Why, why don't you continue? Mm -hmm. Well, and so, you know, so, well, the importance of this is that, you know, the industry has been claiming for uh, at least uh, 25 years that, you know, that ionizing radiation is dangerous, but this <clears throat> non-ionizing radiation can't do anything. You don't have to worry about it. All it can do is heat things. And it's been very clear going back all the way to uh, 1971 and even before that, that this wasn't true, mm -hmm. but we didn't know what the mechanism was. And now we do. And I think that is very important basically because the industry has been, uh, you know, been trying to hoodwink everybody for, for decades. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and now we know how it works. And, and one of the other things that's that's very important about this is that um, you know the, there's a wide variety of different health impacts that have been reported, and now we can explain how all of them work. Mm -hmm. So, or at least all of them may work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so they're plausible mechanisms leading off from this. Uh, well, from let's go into we 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 really haven't discussed the mechanism that you put together. But why don't you bring us through the, the story of how you developed. We found these studies that on calcium channel blockers, a whole variety of different ones, two dozen. Right. And from there, you developed the mechanism. That's right. And so, so what the study showed was that you could block or greatly lower the effects 
by using calcium channel blockers, which are drugs which are highly specific for the, uh, these channels, these voltage-gated calcium channels. And, uh, and so that, that was the key observation. And as you, as you said, and I said already, uh, there are other observations that provide strong support for this as well. Yes. So, well, maybe you can go some of the more details because you had mentioned the heating effect or what's commonly referred to in the literature as the thermal effect. The, the right. industry only believes it's a thermal. Uh, your right. research shows clearly it's a non-thermal. And, but let's go into the mechanism of what happens. You know, what do these calcium channels do? They open up, they allow calcium ions to go into the cell, which are really low concentration normally. But when they hit the EMFs, they open up and they put a million ions a second per channel into the cell and exactly. cause this molecular biological trauma that you figured out. So why don't you go into that? Well, I, yeah, okay, so, so, so then, the, okay, so, L let me just let me just say one other thing before sure. we go. Okay, um, one of the other things about this is that these voltage-gated calcium channels, and I, I abbreviate them VGCCs, mm -hmm. have in their structure something called the voltage sensor. This is a a structure which detects electrical changes across the plasma membrane, and uh, and opens the channel. Mm -hmm. So the obvious thing is that the EMFs are, are working through the voltage sensor to activate the channel. And, and what, what, uh, what is true, and this, this comes out of the physics, is that because of the structure of the voltage sensor and its location in the plasma membrane, one can predict from basic physics it's extraordinarily sensitive to, these, to the electrical forces from these EMFs. And the forces are, are approximately 7.2 million times stronger on the voltage sensor than they are on, uh, on singly charged uh, uh, electrical groups that are in the, the watery parts of the cell, the aqueous parts of the cell, which is where most of them are. So, the, so there, there are extraordinary forces on this thing. And that's how these very weak EMFs, which, again, industry claims can't do anything, are working. They're All working right. by activating this, and, and that, so that's critical. Yeah, I, could, I couldn't agree more, and I think that's one of your major <laughs> findings. And really, mm -hmm. I just want to restate that in a way that some people may better appreciate. That yeah. the consequence of that assessment, which you put together, mm -hmm. means that the safety standards that are in existence today are off by a factor of over 7 million. They're 7 million uh, times off. Yeah. The, this is an approximation. This is not a I know, I know. It might be 6.3, it right. might be 8, who knows? Or it might be it 4 might, million, who knows? Might be but in that million, range. It might, be, it might even be 2 million, but the yeah. point is it's off by a hell of a lot. Yeah, by, <coughs> by an, many orders yeah. of magnitude. Right, exactly. Yeah. At least 7. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, uh, so, okay, so then the question is, as, as you raised, you know, uh, so what happens next? How, how does this lead to? Of what we call effects, mm -hmm. and uh, and so and so you know there are a number of things that we know when you have excess calcium in the cell uh, happen, and uh, and and so one of the things is that you get excess calcium signaling, and one of the things that's critical in that is you get increases in nitric oxide. Okay, now nitric oxide can work mm -hmm. through its signal. There's a nitric oxide signaling pathway. And that is the mechanism by which you get therapeutic effects. Mm -hmm. So there are genuine therapeutic effects that you get from these fields uh, when they're at an appropriate level and when they're focused on a particular part of the body, which needs some help, uh, you can get therapeutic effects. However, what we're concerned about most, obviously, are the pathophysiological effects, the damaging effects that cause various kinds of diseases. And so, uh, so how do they work? Uh, <clears throat> they work, uh, I believe, predominantly uh, by, by two different pathways. One is that nitric oxide <clears throat> can react with superoxide, and superoxide levels also go up in response to uh, in increased calcium in the cell, intracellular calcium. And, uh, and they, they form peroxynitrite, which is a potent oxidant. 
Uh, it's it, it's not a free radical, but it breaks down to, to uh, form uh, reactive free radicals. It's a reactive nitrogen species instead of reactive oxygen. Well, it's it's both. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, you get both, and and uh, you know because you get you get hydroxyl radical, you get carbonate radical, and you get. Yeah, that's a question I had for you. Is it is it more? What causes most of the damage? Is it the perioxy nitrate or is it the hydroxyl free radical? I think. Well, it's, it's not just hydroxyl because the other free radicals are important as well. I think both of them do it, but I think most of the, most of the damage is caused by the free radicals rather than peroxy nitrate. But some of it is caused directly okay. by peroxy nitrate. Okay. And, and, uh, and, so, um, and, and so you get, uh, so you get, you get a lot of, and of course, as, 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 as you know, probably better than almost anybody else, uh, you know, oxidative stress and nitrosative stress are involved in almost every chronic disease you can name. Well, let, so, let, let me stop you there yeah. mm -hmm. because the devil's in the details. And, you know, I, and this is part of the solution, I think. It's, it's not oxidative stress. The, 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 in, the, the, the adjective that needs to be inserted is excessive oxidative stress because there's a certain baseline free radical that's biologically useful and necessary. Like nitric oxide is a free radical. You need it. But it's excessive nitric oxide, especially from stimulating the EMF, that, that causes the damage, the excessive oxidative stress. I, I, yeah, I think so. And what's, what's interesting, actually, and this I, I've published on, but not in any place you can find it easily, is that those two pathways we've just talked about, the nitric oxide signaling pathway and the peroxy nitrite pathway, are, each of them inhibits the other. No, oh, I didn't know that. So, yeah, and, and, and so, you know, if one of them gets turned on, it tends to suppress the other one. Um, and so they're sort of, depending on the condition, one of them may be dominant or the other may be dominant. And, uh, and so uh, I think this is an important thing for understanding. This that whole. is so interesting because I, I didn't develop this technique. It was developed by a friend of mine, Dr. Zach Bush. But it's a series of short exercises, take about three minutes, that mm -hmm. essentially is a high intensity exercise. But the sole purpose of that exercise is to increase nitric oxide production. And I had no idea until you just mentioned it that that will actually lower damage from EMF stress. Um, because yeah, you, it, it, it will do that. And, yeah. and, uh, and so, you know, so one of the things I think that's interesting here is that the EMFs can to some extent, and I, I don't want to overstate this, um, produce opposite effects depending on the conditions that you're using, the tissues that are being exposed, and so forth. So because, because these two pathways basically act against each other. And, uh, and, and so that's, uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, and so, you know, when the industry looks at studies and they say, oh, well, this produces hypertension, and then it's produces hypotension and so oh they can't they must all be wrong and there's no effect well this of course is sheer nonsense because the conditions that are used are different so you can get hypertension and you can get hypotension from EMF exposures so you know so so you you have this kind of nonsense stuff that comes from the industry all the time that uh that uh, simply, you know, when, when you look at the actual mechanisms, there's no basis for these charges. Yeah, well, well, let's talk about the, that industry. I don't know if you've studied it, but many other people have written about books about it. But mm -hmm. uh, many people watching this may not be aware that this industry, the telecommunications industry, is well-funded and perhaps maybe even more well-funded than the pharmaceutical industry and do a very, very effective job of lobbying federal, le federal legislators and in connecting with the media to give them disinformation that only supports their position. And, and in the same part is that they actively discredit, they've got these campaigns, any researcher comes up with opposing views is discredited and they're defunded. We see it in, with Monsanto does it classically and in, and in the drug companies. Yeah. So no, you, do, do you have any experience with that or can you elaborate on that at all or is that what we go to other, other experts for that? Well, I, I, no, I know a lot about it. I know how they've attacked various people, and I know that, you know, in the U, in the U.S., you know, we we take great pride in our science, and we have more <laughs> Nobel laureates than any other country, et cetera, et cetera. But 
the basically the funding for uh, for the MF research was cut off starting in 1986. And what happened was that um, the um, you know the the EPA had some internal research that was going on there. Mm -hmm. Funding for that was cut off in 1986. The uh, U.S. Uh, the U.S. Office of Naval Research had been funding a fair amount of research in this area. They that was in the uh, 70s, 1971. Yeah, uh, back in well, this, okay, yeah, they they were funding stuff, uh, you know, and and after that too, um, and uh, and they stopped funding new grants. In 1986, so there were grants that had been funded already in 1986, and they were, they went to the end of the grant period, but no no new grants were funded. And then uh, the NIH a few years later uh, followed the same pathway, and so um, you know so so what's true is that now in the U.S. Uh, <clears throat> it's it's absolutely shocking to say that. <clears throat> You know what I'm going to say is that uh, there are two countries in the world that are doing a lot of research in this, well beyond their normal scope, um, and they're doing vastly more than the U.S. is doing. And they're Turkey and, and Iran. It's surprising. I mean, there are other countries that are doing research in this. It's not just them, but it's interesting that we have two, you know, two countries that we don't think of as being scientific powerhouses in any in any sense. But in fact, they're doing quite a bit of good research in both of those countries. And uh, on EMS, and we need to give them credit for it. So I just, and, and, and so the U.S. is down, way down the list because basically there's It's no, been suppressed. And the average person doesn't know that. It's hard to do science when you aren't funded. Really yeah. hard. Yeah. And, and, and the industry knows this. They know this. They understand how research gets published. So neither of us, or I think any credible health clinician, is, is questioning the value of objectively done science. But it can't be done if you're not funded. Well, it can be, but it's just more difficult. Well, it's, it's very difficult to do, you know, run a research lab with no right. money. I mean, you right. can't do it. Right. I mean, what I've been doing is I've been doing on my own. I've been contributing my, my time to it. And my efforts, and uh, and and to uh, at least a small extent, some money to it, but it doesn't cost that much. Yeah. So I can do it. Yeah. Well, you're doing most. You're doing the, the literature research. So, and the world owes you a debt of gratitude that they have no understanding of what you're doing, and really establishing the groundwork, the foundational basis for fighting this craziness that has been allowed to persist for the last 50 years, and is only going to get worse only going to get worse mm -hmm. unless yeah. we take action. So, and you, you've yeah. got the basis of how we can take action. So I'm so excited for your work. So l l l let me just go back to the industry thing. Sure. Uh, right here. The, okay. So, so we have, we have the fact that, you know, the, the, the money was cut off and one strongly suspects the industry had a role in that. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the industry uh, with the 1996 Telecommunications Act uh, gave the regulation to the FCC, which has done nothing in terms of protecting the public. And, uh, and, and we have, um, in addition, uh, you know, in, in addition, prevented the public from protecting their health with regard to their exposures from the uh, from the cell phone towers, we couldn't we could not sue to prevent a cell phone tower from uh, from uh, being uh, put you know near our, our workplace or or and, or, and I believe oh, the oops. law the laws have been changed or pretty much set up like they did with vaccines. It's in physically impossible to sue a, a vaccine manufacturer for damage. I think they've set things something similar with the telecommunications where you can't sue them. That's right. Yeah. yeah. They That's have right. immunity. Immunity to, to, to litigation. Yeah. Yeah. So basically what the Congress did was to say our health makes no difference. Yeah. <laughs> right. And it, it's not getting better. I mean, the new head of the FCC 
is the lobbyist for the telecommunications industry. How crazy does that get? That is putting the fox guarding the hen house yeah. into, in, I mean, it's just it's making them the head, the head farmer. So the, the, the corruption in, in this thing has gone, you know, it's been bipartisan corruption. You know, it's gone through, uh, you know, Reagan last term, uh, Bush won, two terms of Clinton, two terms of Bush two, two terms of Obama, and it's continuing even worse under yeah. our administration. So, so we're, uh, we're in uh, extremely deep trouble, and, and I think, uh, but we, we really haven't talked yet about why we're in deep trouble. So. Okay, well, let's go into there, because this is the, yeah. the reasons, you know, because I, I think where you're going next is to where, where's the highest density of the voltage-gated calcium channels, and, and what diseases are going to be a consequence of that exposure. Right. Okay, so 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 the yeah the BGCCs have uh, okay. Let, let me let me before I do that, I, okay. I just want to say that a lot of the pathophysiology also has to do with excessive calcium signaling. Okay, and so it's not just the proxy nitrite uh, pathway that's very important, but it's also true that there's a oh, lot of okay. excessive calcium signaling effects, and they're they're uh, and so you know calcium signaling is very important. Uh, and so when you got way too much of it, you, you have lots of problems. And that's, uh, that's another part of this story that's important to keep in mind. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's go on. <clears throat> Where are these VGCCs? Where are they located? They're, they're, you know, the highest density is in the nervous system. And uh, there are studies uh, going back to the 1950s and 1960s, uh, rodent studies that showed that the nervous system was the number one organ in terms of sensitivity to these EMFs. Uh, and so there was they, there were studies done that showed that there were massive changes in the structure of the neurons, uh, including cell death and including uh, um, dysfunction of the, the synapses and, uh, and, and, and many other things. Um, so the brain is, is, uh, is, is very sensitive. Um, the heart is also sensitive, and I think that the pacemaker cells of the heart are particularly sensitive because they have the highest. Uh, oh, it's good to say that, and but I just want people to know that the consequence of that sensitivity means cardiac arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, PACs, PVCs. If you have these things, EMF is a massive contrib contributing factor that you've got to pay attention to it. Yes. We'll, we'll discuss that later, but uh, so cardiac okay. arrhythmias. Yeah, they're cardiac. <clears throat> yes. Uh, well, also tachycardia and bradycardia, so fast heartbeat and slow okay, heartbeat. Okay, good. So those are others. And, uh, and, and we also get heart palpitation. Which uh, is a PAC or PVC. Yeah. How, how each of those are generated, but yeah. I think that... Uh, well, it's typically a premature atrial or ventricular contraction. That's what they call them, PACs or PVCs. So palpitations. Okay. Yeah, okay. And, and uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, and as you, as I'm sure you know, uh, arrhythmias are often associated with sudden cardiac death. We have a uh, epidemic of young, apparently healthy athletes dying in the middle of an athletic competition. Something that was extraordinarily rare in, in previous decades. Now it's, you know, last two decades it's been uh, happening more and more often. Uh, I think it's due to EMS. I can't tell you for certain that that's true, but it's certainly, uh, it, it, as far as I can figure out, it's not reason why I thought it explains it. So, so there are those things. Okay, now, um, there are also uh, uh, effects on reproduction, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the BGCCs have very important uh, mechanisms in, in the reproductive, you know, and basically in fertility. Is it, is, it, is it more the testes or the ovaries? The testes have been more studied. Okay. I think it's I think it's both. Okay. Uh, but but there's much more data on on the testes, and there there is evidence for both um, causing uh, male infertility and female infertility. Mm -hmm. But the male infertility is is uh, it's been much more studied. Okay. It's much easier to study. So I think it's both, but um, so, 
and uh, <clears throat> maybe I can tell you about a classic experiment that was done on uh, reproduction mm -hmm. uh, that was published uh, 19 years ago uh, by uh, um, uh, Magras and Zenos in, in Greece. Um, they studied, uh, may, they took young, young pairs of mice, one male, one female, put them in a little cage uh, on the ground outside in an antenna park. So we have a bunch of broadcasting antennas, uh, and the levels at the at the ground were well within our current safety guidelines. So if the safety guidelines have any merit, there shouldn't be anything happening. And they put them in two different locations, one with a bit higher level exposure, one with a lower level exposure. What they found was that at the higher level exposure, um, the, the each pair produced uh, one litter that was uh, approximately normal size, uh, maybe a little bit down, uh, and then a second litter that was clearly down in numbers, and then complete infertility, not a single mouse born. Now it only takes 30 days, the gestation period in mice is about 30 days, so it takes about 30 days to go through these things. Uh, so it's, it's a quick experiment. Um, at the lower level exposure, it was basically the same story, except it took twice as long. Okay, so they produced, in fact, four litters with decreasing numbers and then complete infertility. So, you know, and we have now uh, in humans, uh, all, in many, many countries around the world, uh, decreased um, male sperm count. Yeah, down by 50%, over 50% in most countries. Yeah, over 50% in Western countries and about half that amount in other countries around the world. And... Uh, so, so uh, you know, and, and, and the author, the senior author of that paper is saying, well, if this keeps going, we're going to become extinct. And just from the drop in sales per account. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we know that that occurs in humans, in, you know, people who carry their cell phones in their front pockets, <laughs> people, uh, 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 you know, men who use their... Uh, their uh, uh, laptops with the Wi-Fi on, uh, sitting on their lap. We know that occurs. Of course, industry denies everything I have to say. Sure. <laughs> with that. <laughs> but, um, you know, and so, uh, so you know, and, and, and we know we've got great increasing, oh, by the way, it also occurs um, in, and this has been studied in animals in Wi-Fi fields. No question. But I want to go back you mentioned the extinction of the species, and I think you are spot on, and this is what we are contending with. You have the yeah. decrease in fertility, but you also have, you mentioned the nervous system, the, the de increased density there, but you didn't mention yeah. the consequences of that. And there's three consequences, the A's, which should be anxiety because their voltage-gated calcium channels are responsible for the neuroendocrine hormone release and neurotransmitters, anxiety, depression, autism, and Alzheimer's. So why don't you expand on that because you, you gave a brilliant presentation at Autism One. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, so, you've been doing your homework. I'm, I'm yeah, so if uh, we've got autism on one end, the beginning yeah. end, Alzheimer's at the next, and you're not fertile, what's going to happen to humans? Are we not going to be, in the, there, there's no 22nd century. Yeah, I, and, and, and they're, 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 well, uh, let, me, let me just go, go off on something else because. Okay, we, sure. The one thing that I've really published on in, in, in uh, you know, substantial detail on that are the neuropsychiatric effects. That's and right. yeah. uh, so, you know, I already said uh, you, get, you get, you know, massive sort of cumulative effects on the brain in, in animals exposed to these EMFs. Um, and, uh, um, you know, the, the VGCC mechanism predicts that you're going to get massive effects in the brain because there's, you know, because there, there's some, you know, there, there's such high densities and they're so important in the brain. Uh, but, uh, and, and we also have, interestingly, um, genetic polymorphism studies, which show that elevated uh, VGCC activity for the most important one in the brain and is, produces uh, various kinds of neuropsychiatric effects. So we know you can you can get neuropsychiatric effects from these uh, from from this mechanism, and 
and and and what I did was I re reviewed a whole bunch of studies on various kinds of EMF exposures, each of them showing uh, uh, neuropsychiatric effects. And and so what you find is that these effects have been that have been repeated uh, many times um, in these uh, in these epidemiological studies. Um, are uh, the same things that everybody's complaining about. Uh, I'm tired all the time. I can't sleep. I can't concentrate. Uh, I'm depressed. I have, uh, yeah, I'm anxious all the time. Um, you know, uh, the uh, all all the things. Uh, I, my memory doesn't work well anymore. Sure. All the things everybody's complaining about. We know all those things are caused by EMF exposures. Mm -hmm. So there's no doubt about that. Okay. And, uh, you know, because we have, we, you know, we, we know their effects on the brain. We know that the, uh, that the VGCC's excessive activity can, can produce very, you know, various neuropsychiatric effects. And here we've got, uh, you know, all this, uh, all this epidemiological data that confirms this is happening in humans. Uh, who uh, live near cell phone towers, uh, who were exposed to Wi-Fi, who were uh, exposed to broadcasting radiation, who use their cell phones heavily, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, uh, that's going on. And, uh, you know, and uh, so that's, you know, very important. And I think um, well, well, let we should me get talk about this. Yeah, let me expand into this because the other issue is cancer. And, and I think my understanding, I just wrote a book, Fat for Fuel, yeah. which really discusses about the, the metabolic theory of cancer and focuses on the function of the mitochondria. And it seems to key, but we, to key in perfectly what you're teaching because the EMF actually causes excessive oxidative stress, which can damage mitochondria. Now, yeah, and you also, mentioned also, early on that these VGCCs are in the cellular membrane. I don't believe they're on the mitochondrial cell membrane, though. Are they just an the external cell, cell membrane? I'm not sure about that. I tried looking that up, and I want to, I, 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 I'm not sure whether there is or, or is not. But, it, but anyway, this, this excessive oxidative stress can damage mitochondria. We know that contributes to cancer. That's why yeah. women who put their cell phone in their bra get cancer in the upper inner quadrant, which is a very rare place to find cancer. It's almost always in the upper outer quadrant. You know, and if you people who get here get brain cancer. So, you know, in some ways, I think the publicizing and emphasizing the, the danger of EMFs to cancer is, is counter, counterproductive because most people don't know people with brain cancer dying from cell phones, and they know everyone uses cell phones. But what they do see is people dropping like flies from lack of energy, from heart attacks, from cardiac arrhythmias, from autism, from Alzheimer's. This they see. So they have to understand it's not just the brain cancer, it's everything else. I That's agree. the key. Yeah. So do you, I, I, you know, in my judgment, cancer is down around number four or number five on the list. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of my concerns, and it's not that it, it, there's anything about cancer that's that's not important. I mean, it's very important, and and we're just looking right now at the early stages because of the long latencies. In right. And, and then let's let's address that. We're like, the latency is there is virtually no one watching this. Less than one percent of you had a cell phone in 1995 or 1997. So we're talking about two decades. That's it. And, and then it was just a progressive increase. Most people, it's probably this century that they had a cell phone. So it's not yeah. that long. You know, the studies on cancer have been, have been uh, blocked in a lot of ways by the industry, in particular by uh, uh, preventing researchers from getting information about hev how heavily the cell phones have been used. So basically, you know, you, you, you can't, you know, you, you can't get the information about how heavily individuals have been using their cell phones, uh, even if they're willing, you know, even if the individuals are willing to have the, the data released, you can't get that. Uh, so uh, from the industry, they won't give it to you. So basically, you know, obviously it's, it's the people who use the heavy, most heavily that, that are at great risk. And there is, there is some epidemiology that shows that. But it's been much harder to get yeah. because of the industry position. Right. Um, and uh, 
So, you know, I think, but the other thing I want to say is that with regard to cancer, we know that EMFs cause DNA damage to mm -hmm. our cells. Single and double-stranded breaks. Single and double-stranded. By, also, the, by uh, the alkaline uh, comet assay, right? Yes, and uh, there's also a lot of data that's never been reviewed, but there's a lot of data that you get excessive level of oxidized bases, uh, and particularly 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine. Um, well, in DNA. I got one question on the, the DNA breaks. What do you yeah. believe causes more DNA breaks? Ionizing radiation in the air, gamma rays at 40,000 feet, or mm -hmm. conventional x-rays or CAT scans, or regular use of the cell phone? It seems like from your literature, you're thinking it's, it's the micro radiation is going to cause more DNA breaks. Well, yes, I, I, I do think that's true. And, and, uh, and so the question is, what's the evidence of this? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so there were, there were three studies that were published uh, by a group in, uh, in Germany, uh, headed by uh, Professor Franz, uh, um, I'm sorry, spacing out here. Um, um, <laughs> All right, uh, what are the studies? Adel yeah, he, yeah, so the, they're in German. Yeah, Franz Adelkoffer, and he, he did two of these in, in collaboration with uh, uh, Hugo Rudinger in, in Austria. And uh, the first study was done where they compared um, ionizing radiation, the equivalent of 1,600 chest X-rays. Mm -hmm. These were done in cell culture. They were done with, you know, and they compared them with uh, the, the DNA breaks that you got from what they described as uh, 24 hours on a cell phone. Okay, and I'll, I'm gonna tell you that it's actually not a cell phone here that was studied. Um, and, uh, and, and what they found was equivalent amounts of, or roughly equivalent amounts of, of DNA breaks so from the two. So two days on a cell phone equals 1600 x-rays. DNA damage in 24 hours, yeah, okay, 24. 1600, yeah, chest X-rays, right? In vitro that was, assays. That was what they found. Now, now, in fact, that underestimates the effects of cell phones. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, first, because they used, um, they used a, a continuous wave. You know, oh, and they're and it's not pulsed. Yeah. And 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 we know there's extensive evidence that the pulse EMFs are much more uh, damaging than the uh, than the continuous wave EMFs. That's important in for quite a number of reasons, including the fact that uh, all wireless communication devices communicate via pulsations, and so they're much more dangerous because of that. Um, and so then they published two other papers. One was they compared a pulsed EMF with, uh, with a non-pulsed EMF and showed, yes, it was more active. And then they did a third paper, which is the paper that industry loves to hate, which was uh, the, the senior author was uh, Schwartz. Uh, so it's Schwartz et al. paper. And uh, these are all published in English, by the way. And uh, the, uh, in, in that paper, uh, showed that when you use pulsations that are were designed to be similar to what the pulsations you get from a real cell phone, uh, you got still much more damaging at much lower uh, intensities. So, uh, so cell phones are are highly active, and so this raises a question: How can this possibly be? And 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 I think. I think the answer actually comes from the the you know the kind of diagram that I that I I published, uh, which is how uh, you know how EMFs produce free radicals. Okay. Right, and we'll we'll uh, have we'll have a copy of that in our article so that people can see that. Okay, great. So so what what you get then is that uh, so you know both ionizing radiation and uh, and the microwave frequency EMFs uh, produce DNA damage through free radicals. Okay, so they're similar in that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in the way in which you get the free radicals is through the peroxy nitrate pathway. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that you know when you go from the EMS to to the free radicals on that pathway, there are three steps mm -hmm. that involves high levels of amplification. Mm -hmm. 
So one of them is, as, as you mentioned before, when you open up the channels, you get about a, a million uh, calcium ions flowing in per second. The second is that, uh, is that uh, you get increases in nitric oxide and superoxide. Uh, and, and so those, in effect, the, the calcium is acting catalytically because once it's in the cell and as long as it's elevated, you keep getting more and more of those things. And, and then those two react with each other to form proxy nitrite and, and the uh, reaction rate is the product of the two. So you have three levels of amplification. Well, you, you have three levels of amplification, you can get a hell of a response to a very small yeah, so it is interesting because it's true. The industry is saying that there's not enough energy in a microwave radiation to, to cause direct damage to the covalent bonds in DNA. There isn't. The no, energy, in it. it's, it's only biologically amplifi uh, biological amplification resulting in excessive oxidative stress that causes it. But it caught, interestingly, that ionizing radiation that causes the damage, I think in one of your papers you mentioned too, that that uh -huh. ionizing radiation that has the energy to break the bonds, but actually more of the, the breaks are due to the secondary oxidative stress that breaks the DNA. It's right. not the yeah. directly from the, the energy within, the, within the, the radiation. Right, right, yeah. And then that, you know, that was known, uh, that was published by uh, Arthur Compton back in 19, well, he got the Nobel Prize for it in 1927. And it, the way in which ionizing radiation works, it basically, hits uh, molecules and atoms and knocks electrons out and you get pairs of free radicals generated. Uh, and that's called Compton scattering. Yeah. And, and, and so there is, there is amplification from ionizing radiation, but it's only at one level, mm -hmm. namely that one that we just mentioned. Right. Uh, you get three levels of amplification with the, uh, with the, the microwave frequency uh, EMFs. And so, uh, so the amount of damage you get um, based on those studies is truly extraordinary. And of course, you know, as as I think you know, um, Adelkoffer and Rudinger would have been severely attacked by the industry. Oh yeah. And, you know, he and, has an interesting uh, his history. This, this, is, this is absolutely beautiful work. I mean, this is this is. Uh, yeah, I think it was his organization Veritas. He he was hired by the tobacco industry initially, funded in Germany, and Deborah Davis did a nice job in uh, uh, explaining his whole process. Yeah. But, but I want to get back to what we can do, because now that we've concerned, hopefully you have appropriate concern about this issue now. So what they can do, and, and I want you to help, help us understand, prioritize our exposures. So uh, that would be really good to understand, because let me, let me name the exposures. Cell phone towers, which I think are relatively low, low down on the list, unless you're right next door to one. Cell phone towers, your cell phone, which is a huge one. Wi-Fi routers, Bluetooth. Bluetooth headsets or any Bluetooth objects, the Internet of Things, smart thermostats, baby monitors, uh, and I think what may be the most important, uh, smart meters, mm -hmm. uh, and then one of the most important ones, which hardly anyone looks at, is actually the microwave itself, which initially was developed as the radar range. Microwaves are radars, okay? That's the signals they use. Yeah. But yeah. I, I, we're, I'm gonna shoot a video right after this showing people that uh, we, we, there's different units, there's different devices you can get to measure microwaves. And no, it's not a tri-field Gauss meter. That does not measure it. You have to get a specific device to measure from a few hundred gigahertz to the, to a um, few hundred megahertz to the gigahertz range and mm -hmm. see what it is. But it's like a thousand, it's, when you turn on your microwave within 10 to 15 feet, it's a thousand times higher radiation, a thousand times, which is more than your cell phone. So I wonder if you can, from your perspective, you could prioritize those risk factors so that people know, because the first step in helping yourself and your family is to limit the exposure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, okay, so let, let me just say, I, you know, I've researched at least some of the evidence on, uh, you know, on, on cell phone towers, on cell phones, Cordless phones, by the way, are also. Oh, I forgot those. Yeah, it didn't have an exclusive uh, list, right? And uh, and uh, Wi-Fi uh, and um, smart meters. There's not. There's very little data on smart meters, basically for the reasons I talked about before. There's no money. Um, and so so, uh, but what data we have is 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 uh, looks you know looks looks bad and certainly the anecdotal reports that you know one hears 
are that those are those are, are bad. Um, but they're all bad. You know, all of those are bad. Um, microwave ovens, I'm not so sure about uh, because I really haven't researched that. Um, well, you know, you you don't have to guess. You can buy these meters. They're not horribly expensive. Right. They're only hundreds of dollars. They're not like thousands. No, and you no, can buy them and that. measure it yourself in your microwave oven in your home. I, I, you know, and I have, I use a, yeah, I use a cornet meter pretty regularly. But, you know, but the, the problem basically is the following. We know that, you know, as I mentioned before, that the pulsed EMFs are in most cases uh, much more active than the non-pulsed EMFs that are continuous wave EMFs. Mm -hmm. And... The, uh, but the other problem is... Is it, is it microwave oven continuous or pulse? Is it continuous? Well, it's it's pulsed, but it's pulsed basically because it runs off the, you know, 60 hertz current. Oh, okay. Okay. So you have a particular kind of pulsation. And so it's not just a question of how much you've got, but how dangerous is that kind of pulsation mm -hmm. versus other kinds of pulsation. So it's not an easy thing to compare. It's, it's not an easy easy thing to say. I think in general, and th this has been argued by, uh, by a number of people, including uh, uh, Demetrius Panagopoulos in Greece, that in general, the more pulse things are, the more dangerous they are. But, you know, that's sort of a, um, and, and that's at least roughly right, but it may not be precisely right. And, and I think, uh, you know, so, so, so we have a lot of problems, but in general, uh, it's not that easy to 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 make the kind of health assessment, uh, you know, without data. But you know, the basic problem we have, the fundamental problem we have, is that not one of these devices, not even one, not even once, are tested biologically for safety mm -hmm. before they're put out to expose an unsuspecting public. They are never tested for safety. All the assurances of safety are based on this theory that only that they can only produce effects by heating. And we've known if we were paying attention to the data that that was wrong 40, 45 years ago. And, and even so, with that flawed assessment, there's still warnings on every phone to hold it more than an inch away from your head. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, which people don't know about. Right. Uh, because they're in very fine print. Yeah, it's 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 bizarre. And as 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 you mentioned before, my best estimate of of the of the safety guidelines is they're off by a factor of something like seven point two million. Yeah. <laughs> I, we're in an absolutely insane situation. I mean, it's just crazy. Uh, but, but, but but it's important to know what I've neglected to mention is that your understanding of this came in 2012. You published in 2013. It was a highly cited article and still is. Won an award. Mm -hmm. So this is, it's only been published for four years. Yeah. And you, you've had some effort. We're going to seek to publicize this and make this public aware because once you know the mechanism, you can remediate. And I want to talk about that now if I can is that you put together the mechanism through the two dozen studies that had calcium channel blockers. And I instantly thought of, I personally would never use a recommended drug. I mean, there's not never, but virtually never recommend. Obviously there's, there's exceptions for every rule. But mm -hmm. so what's the natural alternative from a calcium channel? It's magnesium. And virtually everyone's, everyone's deficient in magnesium. So I'm wondering if, if you've reviewed any, if you have any thoughts uh, on the molecular biology of high dose magnesium supplement. I mean, I'm talking like well above 500% higher than the recommendations, like maybe two grams of elemental magnesium a day to, subs to serve as a, as a blocker to stop, like the calcium channel blockers did in the studies, in the in vitro and the, the animal studies, to block the effects of the EMF or radically reduce them. I, I I don't I don't know of any uh, of any data on that. I've heard that there can be problems with very high levels of magnesium. Yeah. Well, we're, we're yeah, I, I want to talk well, to you afterwards. We're going to fund we're going to fund some research to, to look okay. at that because I think. I mean, what, what what I say is that um, the main problem with magnesium, I think, is the one that you you mentioned before, and that is that almost all of us are magnesium deficient. Mm -hmm. because our diets are low in magnesium and because the soils have been depleted in magnesium. <laughs> and, 
And, uh, and so uh, I think that a lot of the effects, so, so it, it's, it, it is clear that um, when we're deficient in magnesium, you get uh, excessive activity of the VGCCs. So it's important to allay that deficiency. Uh, and the and other and problem- that's, that's documented. When you're magnesium deficient, you're, you have increased VGCC activity. Yeah, I mean, at least in animals, it's been shown. Okay. Yeah. Or, or in, and also cells and culture, you can, you can show that. So yeah, and um, and uh, the other thing which is is uh, is is clear is that you also get excessive calcium influx through uh, some uh, through the N NMDA receptors, and so that's problematic as well. And so um, yeah, so it, it's it's certainly good and important to allay the magnesium deficiency. And, uh, you know, and I, I, I think, you know, I think we should all be doing that anyway. All right. So the question is, is the, the research shows that deficiency in magnesium will contribute to enhanced MVGC activity, but it doesn't know that an increase in it would actually block that receptor. So we don't know that yet. I don't think, well, you know, the problem is that receptors are important for function. Yeah. But, well, you know, it, but, but it's much better to block it with something natural than a drug, which is indiscriminate. Well, I, I don't think we can block it. I mean, you well, know, at they, least reduce it, reduce it. Yeah. And, and so, uh, yeah, um, there, there are other ways of, of, um, <laughs> I guess, I guess, uh, you know, what, what I do and I, you know, I always tell people I'm a PhD, not an MD and none of this should be viewed as medical advice, but I think one, one approach to dealing with these things is to, uh, raise the level of NERF2, NRF number two, yes. which I've published on. Well, be, and that's, that's a biological mimetic, which upregulates uh, hormetic, I'm not hormetic, uh, mimetic, hormetic, upregulates up the superoxide dismutase, catalase, uh, and all the other beneficial intracellular antioxidants. Yeah, it does that, but it does many other things as well. All right, tell us what else it does. Well, it lowers inflammation. It improves mitochondrial function. Um, it helps detoxify the body uh, from uh, both carbon-containing toxicants and uh, and toxic metals. And uh, <laughs> I guess that'll do for a start anyway. Yeah. And so, how do you how do you activate NERF two? Well, the common way is sulforaphane from cruciferous vegetables like broccoli. Yeah, but there are many many other other nutrients that that raise nerve too. I published a paper on that. Oh, you're going to have to give me that paper. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you, you can get it. You can pull it out of PubMed. Just, uh, what's the, just, what's the title? It, it just put in, just put in my, you know, my last name, P-A-L-L and initials M-L and nerve two, and it'll pop right up and you can download it. Okay, good. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, and and so, I've got a, I've got a novel targeted selective antioxidant that I think would be really useful that also stimulates nerve two. And I want to talk to you that off camera. There, there are a lot of things that, that raise NERF2, and they include uh, the long chain omega 3s in fish oil. They include uh, a lot of um, uh, phenolic antioxidants. Mm -hmm. They include um, um, the, uh, well, sulforaphane you mentioned, the, uh, the isothiocyanates from the cabbage group. They include, um, I'm trying to remember which, which one, they, they include a lot of the sulfur compounds in garlic and onions. Uh, they include terpenoids, um, so a lot of the plant materials, mm -hmm. a lot of the things, in fact, a lot of things that occur in various kinds of, uh, of, uh, herbs, including, you know, herbs that we eat and also, uh, you know, uh, traditional herbal sure. uh, medicine. Yeah. So, so, so there are a lot of things that, that raise nerve too. They're, they're, um, and, uh, uh, they include, um, the carotenoids, which I, I didn't mention. Yeah, so that's we good. So uh, interesting. I did not realize realize that carotenoids up upregulated the nerve two pathway. Did not know okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, you should read my paper and you. I am definitely going to read it. Believe me, I will read it very very soon. A lot of good stuff in there. Yeah. Okay. So you just provided us with the mechanism of how eating a healthy diet helps lower the damage from EMF exposure. Well, to the nerve yeah, pathway. And, and you know, one of the things that I argued in that paper is the two most helpful diets known, the traditional Mediterranean diet, traditional Okinawan diet, 
are both high in nutrients that raise nerve too. Yeah. So I think a lot of the health promotion of those diets goes through that pathway. Excellent. And by the way, yes. uh, to connect up with something else we talked about, um, the, um, the nitric oxide signaling pathway mm -hmm. raises nerve. And yeah, that's, right. how I think, I, that's how I think those two, that's what, one of the mechanisms important for those two pathways working against each other. Yeah. The nitric oxide signaling pathway regulates the oxynitrite pathway. Did not know that either. Did not know that affected nerve, okay. nerve two. So, okay. but it's not just creating the nitric oxide, it's actually releasing it as a signaling molecule into circulation, which is what you do with the nitric oxide dump. Look up my video, my other video, maybe we'll put it in here because you should do that if you're concerned about cell phone exposure because you're going to lower the, your response to exposure, inevitable exposure. Yes, you should lower your, radi your exposure, get a meter, measure it, lower it as much as possible, but you also want to live a healthy lifestyle. And by doing that, you'll actually improve your ability to withstand the damage from it. Yeah, I mean, obviously avoidance is, is the key thing yeah, here. Yeah. And will always be the key thing here, but but there are other things that are useful, and I think they. Okay. They should well, we, we we've kind of reached the end of our limit that we're for a normal interview. So if you would like to emphasize some points or summarize it or make a recommendation for resources to, to go to, and then we'll conclude, and uh, we'll probably have you on again because you're such a, a, a wealth of information. Well, I, I you know I think yeah. <laughs> I, you know, the one thing that they emphasize is that is is that this whole this whole nonsense that the industry has been putting forth is is just that it's just nonsense, and we are we are literally destroying our health in many different ways. And I think, you know, we talked about the extinction issue, and I think there are actually uh, six different ways in which uh, it's. You know, it's it's probable that we will generate our own extinction rather quickly from these EMFs. Uh, but I think one of the things that's important here is that when you look at the effects of the EMFs on on the brain, and when you look at the effects of EMFs on the reproductive system, they both develop slowly over time. Those are the things we're not aware of mm -hmm. because they develop slowly. I mean, it's not like getting, you know, hit in the head by something. Uh, you, you know, it develops over periods of months and sometimes years. Like smoking. And, like smoking. You know, and, and, and so we're not aware of them even though they have, you know, they, 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 they are cumulative and they develop quite severe effects. And so, so this is something where, you know, where, where I think... People are not aware of this because they develop slowly over time, despite the severity of the eventual effects. And that's something that, you know, that, that I think all of us keep in mind. Okay. Well, sage advice. Again, I cannot thank you enough, and I'm going to be a surrogate person, uh, sur serve as a surrogate to express the sincere gratitude that we have for the pioneering work you have done in elaborating on the biological mechanism for EMF damage, which has such massive potential to really fight the misinformation of the telecommunications industry and, and really hopefully help us get back to biological safety standards, and not back to, but at least adopt them and then develop some, some remediation strategies that can actually limit or radically reduce the damage. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming.